uh, today we're going through the welterweight grand prix as part of fight night picks parry and counter grand prix one. week and matt listen a lot of people some of them haven't been happy with our brackets of 16 so i'm going to break it down at the first part of this video maybe you can help me out a little bit so what we did with all of these weight classes from 125 up to 265 videos coming out every single day we had the champion and listed them as number one. And then every other entry on this list, we hit shuffle about five or six times and let the chips fall where they laid. So you get Usman Ray Cooper in this. You get Conor McGregor at 14. The seeds don't really matter. The only one in particular is the fact that the champion's up at the top and number one. Apart from that, it's shuffled. Matt, there's a lot of fun matchups that there have come is. out of this. Again, some people might not agree with some of these people. I mean, we've got Ray Cooper the third from PFL. We've got Magomed Magomed Karimov from PFL. We've got Roberto Soldich from KSW. We have Douglas Lima from Bellator. So you get a little bit of a cross-section from all sorts of different organizations in today's video. Maybe some names were omitted that you might want to see up here. I can think of a few. I mean, maybe somebody wanted to see Robbie Lawler or Rafael Dos Anjos. But still, we went with what we went with. And if you want to let us know, maybe we missed some of your favorite fighters in the comments. Please do so. But Matt, a lot of fun matchups here. Also, some special rule. These are kind of prag rules. And all of these fights are happening in one night. That's why if there is like a 50-50 fight it's gonna matter a lot on who they fought before in the whole tournament that's also don't get mad at us if we do think that someone's going to be another person and in all likelihood in real life you know it might not happen if you have a lot of really hard fights before you get into the finals it's going to affect you in some way so pride style tournament it's a one night affair every fight is a five rounder five minute five rounder these aren't amateur fights with so three minutes we're five minutes so, so you could take a ton of damage in one of these fights which we're gonna get to later on down the road but this is one of the most interesting divisions one of the most compelling divisions because it's one of the most talent rich in all of mma like i mentioned a lot of different cross sections from a lot of different organizations and a lot of really good fights in this bracket of 16 so if you want to start off with one of the fights that you're looking forward to most out of this bracket at 170. So this fight a year and a half ago, two years ago, would have probably been the best fight to make, regardless of organization or weight class. And that's Tyron Woodley and Douglas Lima. We just kind of got lucky that they ended up facing each other in this first round. But two years ago, when Lima had won the belt back from McDonald and Tyron Woodley was still champion, this is a really, not real fight, I shouldn't say, because we all know the UFC would never cross promote with Bellator. But it was a fight that was really interesting because for the first time ever, we had a champion outside the UFC who in all like maybe not in all likelihood, but who actually had a pretty good chance of being better than the UFC champion. And this is the matchup. So that's one that stands out to me the most. Which one do you like? To me, it's the all-violence fight because you have the technicality of Jeff Neal and the brawling, just absolute thunder from Roberto Soldich that we have in our third fight from the top. That's a wild fight. That's one that we'll get into. So if we start up at the top, Kamaru Usman taking on Ray Cooper the third. Ray Cooper the third, a good wrestler in his he own is. right. We've seen it in PFL where mm. Against Magomed, Magomed Karimov, it didn't work out in the finals of Season 1. In Season 2, Magomed Karimov out due to injury. Ray Cooper the third climbs all the way up the ladder. And I want to say, too, Magomed, Magomed Karimov, undefeated in PFL. And if it wasn't for that injury, he probably would have been a repeat 100%. champ, which we've seen a ton Schultz and Lance Palmer able to do that. But Magomed it Karimov... It would have been the worst thing for the PFL if he didn't get hurt, let's be honest. But Ray Cooper the third able to win the second season, competing in the third season. I've seen him on Instagram training for it in Hawaii with his brothers. Exciting now, guy. he's taken on Kamaru Usman in this fight, <laughs> who's arguably pound for pound your best welterweight out there in the world. I think it would be a very interesting fight because for pound, they all weigh the same. No, that's true. That that much is true. That was a that was a blunder yeah. on my part. But Ray Cooper the third, he's got bricks for hands. Yes. Kamaru Usman has cardio for days. It's a very interesting matchup. What do you think of that one? <laughs> it's not interesting at all. Kamaru Usman beats Ray Cooper the third three. Uh, he could fight him. Okay, this is going to be such a buy in the first round. Just because I know Ray Cooper the third, like you said, really explosive guy, has good wrestling but not great wrestling. And the other problem, too, with Ray Cooper the third is he, if he doesn't knock you out in that first round, round two is going to be a little bit slower. Round three, four, and five, of course, just increasingly so. And with Kamaru Usman's style, it's just so detrimental to have a style like Ray Cooper the third against Usman, especially this early on in the tournament, because Usman's just going to take him down, sap him of all that energy, not take much damage in return, and either beat him in one of the more one-sided five-round decisions you've ever seen, or get a TKO via ground and pound, or maybe submission later on in the fight. So I would say Usman's on, and he's not taking much damage either. Yeah, I would agree with you there. I think he would win a five-round decision, and Usman moving on to our next round. Now, the next fight, another Great very fight. interesting one. You've got Nate Diaz taking on Leon Edwards. It's a battle of England and the United States, the 209. Nate Diaz, I mean, in MMA, it's hard to find a better pure boxer. Oh. 
But Leon Edwards has some pretty darn good box. He does. Here's the weird thing. I'm not 100% sold on Leon Edwards yet. And I know for a lot of people that RDA win, and especially how dominant it was, was what sort of pushed him over the edge. And a lot of people are on Leon Edwards' side thinking that he's won maybe one, if not uh, deserving a title shot, one fight away or deserving a title shot right now. Leon Edwards, to me, you can't do that RDA trick over and over again. Too many people have gotten number one contenderships off RDA at this point. I get the first time, I get the second time maybe, but ever since that, he's been dropping back and back in the rankings. I mean, Michael Chiesa, and no disrespect to Michael Chiesa, but in my mind, he's not really the top, top tier for the welterweights, just yet at least, and he was able to beat RDA quite handily, so I don't really know how much I can put uh, the RDA win, uh, have, Leon, have Leon Edwards beaten ADS because the RDA win, but... With all that being said, Leon Edwards is a real welterweight, so I just think the size and the strength advantage would be too much for Nate. Now, I know there's a lot of people that would disagree with the statement that you just made, namely uh, Skip Bayless and Shannon Sharp. I mean, Nate Diaz Civil easily had tough. yeah 30 to 40 pounds on Conor McGregor when they first fought. But in terms of this fight, again, really crisp and technical boxing from these two guys. You're not going to see a lot of looping shots. You're not going to see no. a lot of punches miss. And I doubt that the fight goes to the ground. Now, here's the interesting thing. Nate Diaz... We know it has second to none jujitsu. Go back and watch the fight against Takanori Gomi. And yeah, maybe He's Gomi. Not a good grappler, though. Maybe Gomi wasn't a great grappler at the time. He had, he had fought Nick at one point. Like, it was a really interesting fight nonetheless. But Nate Diaz, you could see his submission ability oh, yeah. at that point and moving forward in his career. It's such a great base that he has with the jujitsu, but also the boxing. But. Where I'm going with this, yeah. Leon Edwards, his wrestling was something that came into question for a long time. You look at British boxers. I mean, look at Jimmy Manuel at 205. It never really worked out for him in that regard. For me, have a the, fight, the fight that won me over with Leon Edwards was a fight against Gunnar Nelson because That's you right. always had to worry about the karate, the wrestling, the jiu-jitsu, Gunnar Nelson really being the complete package, and Leon Edwards steamrolled right through he him. Did. And for that, for me, I think in a five-round fight, especially with the pressure, the uh, not just the pressure, but the power that Leon Edwards possesses, and then also the X factor, and it's not really an X factor, it's more like a P factor because it's higher up in the alphabet. The fact that Nate Diaz, the way that he fought against Jorge Masvidal, the fact that if he takes too much damage, he's going to get cut That's open, true. and you're liable to a doctor stoppage. So uh, we're spending a little bit more time on this matchup, but I, I kind of agree with what you're saying, but I don't at the same time. I think Leon Edwards is going to win this fight. Uh, let me just say that very clearly. If they fought in real life, if this is your headliner for a fight night or something, Leon Edwards is going to win. I don't know if it would be because of the power, though, or because of the uh, elbows or clinch work or anything. I just don't think Leon Edwards is that big power, heavy-handed kind of guy. A lot of his fights in the UFC have gone to decision. He dropped Gilbert Burns once. He was able to do good damage to RDA, but he's not... He's not a finisher in the way that, like, a Jorge Masvidal is, where when Masvidal hits you, you're probably going to go down. Leon Edwards is a really, really good striker. He doesn't have crazy power. He's got good volume. He's just kind of good at everything. So I do agree with you that Leon Edwards will win this fight. So, I just maybe do a little different way. Leon Edwards moving on, Kamar Usman moving on, and then our next fight. Like I said, this is the all-violence crown, if there was one, in this bracket of 16. Jeff Neal, Roberto Soldich. We've seen it from Soldich. I mean, let's pick out a couple of losses. He lost to Drika Stuplas. He got finished. He followed that up and knocked out Drikas Duplessis. He's got a loss to Yaroslav Amasov, who's currently undefeated in Bellator, and you could easily have thrown him into this bracket. Why do you like this fight? For the exact reason you said, both these guys are going to stand and completely brawl. Not really brawl. Jeff Neal's super technical guy on the feet. He's kind of the perfect counter to a brawler because he throws such crisp and clean shots right down the middle. Of, and then everyone who we see him fight, especially as of lately, I mean, Nico Price, uh, Mike Perry, guys who... Yes, they might be more powerful than a Jeff Neal, but all their strikes are these big looping shots, and Jeff Neal was able to sort of cut through all that, land his, really tech, land his good techniques, his left high kick's absurd, and then Saldich, I mean, he's basically Justin Gaethje at this point, just one of those guys outside the UFC who, you might know who he is even though you might have never watched him fight before, he's going to put on a fight of the night no matter what, so I couldn't agree with you more, this other than Tyra Lee Douglas Lima is my second most, uh, and, I mean, if, if you're looking at gyms and strength of gyms, Roberto Soldich, the guy that's trained at UFD for a long time, one of the better gyms um, in Europe. And then you look at where he's training now. He's at TriStar working out with GSP now. For some fighters, it hasn't worked out. It's one of those things, to me, where it seems like if you train at TriStar for quite a long time, yeah. it works out quite a bit better for you. But taking on Jeff Neal from Fortis MMA and Saif Saud, who's one of the best oh, yeah. coaches right now in the sport, him and Eugene Behrman kind of holding that title, this is one of the better fights. But like you said, with Roberto Soldich, a lot of looping hooks, a lot of power. You have to worry about that. 
but you also have to worry about it. And, and he's fought in five round fights exactly. before, and he's won decisions before. But I would definitely take Jeff Neal as a fresher fighter in that circumstance. One hundred percent. Jeff Neal's kind of like my new Santiago Ponzinibbio since he's gone all of a sudden. Just kind of this up and coming striker who no one wants to fight right like now. Like Abdul Razak Al Hassan, if he can get it back. Sure. But Jeff Neal definitely on the up and up in his career. And this would be such an exciting fight, but I do think Neal would win. Next fight, Steven Thompson, Magomed, Magomed, Karimov. This could be an exciting fight, but it probably won't be because you know from Magomed, Magomed, Karimov. And again, seating doesn't matter whether it's 4 or 13. Again, it's all shuffled around. But Magomed, Magomed, Karimov, you know what you're going to get from him. It's it's going to be intense pressure, great wrestling, and a really good top game, top game. And that's where he's gotten, you know, to an undefeated record with PFL against a lot of fighters who have a similar background. Some of them don't, but Walter Waite's going to be very interesting for them this year, especially with the addition of Roy McDonald. Now, only thing for him, it's unfortunate that in the first round of this tournament, he's taken on Stephen Thompson, who, yeah, a lot of people might look back to the loss against Anthony Pettis, but Matt, what happened in Stephen Thompson's last fight? I fought Vicente Luque, a guy who I don't know if you've been watching our channel for a little while. I was insanely high on. And when I say insanely high on, I may have said he's my number one prospect to look out for of last year. Uh, he beat the brakes off Vicente. Of and a performance that a lot of people are kind of forgetting about. People like to bring up Wonder Boy when they're talking about the 170-pound division. But people forget about just how good he looked in that fight. It was a fight of the night. Both guys kind of put it on each other at some points. But once Wonder Boy found his timing, he kind of went back to that Wonder Boy where it's no matter what you do on the feet, what Stephen Thompson's already seen it a thousand times, if not tens of thousands of times. And all the reads he was able to make at such a fast time, put Luke A. down multiple times, beat him up really badly in that third round. And with a guy like uh, Stephen Thompson... You, to take him down, you have to be close to him. He's never close to you. He's always got that sideways stance. He's switching stances constantly. He's never really in a position to just get cleanly taken down. You might be able to get him up against the cage and trip him, but he's one of these guys, and I think Wonderboy did it the right way in his training. If you're really, really good at striking, don't focus so much on the grappling as much as just get up. That's really all you need to do. Find ways to get back up to your feet. Be smart about it. And Wonderboy's really be able to do that well. And has a pretty good brother-in-law to train with every That's now true. and again in Chris Weidman at 185 pounds. Is that the home? Is 205 the home? But still, in a fight against Magomed, Magomed, Karimov, I would certainly take the tech, the technique of Thompson's karate background. I mean, such a good striker. And he typically excels against wrestlers. I know in the fights against Woodley, yeah, he might not have won, but still very close fights against the best of the best. Exactly. And it's it's iron sharpening iron at that point. Woodley can strike, and Mega Man, not to be disrespectful, he really just wrestles. Like, his wrestling's a 20 out of 10, it's, but his striking's not nearly at a high enough level. So as he's going to try to close that distance to take down Wonderboy, Wonderboy's going to light him up and move out of the way constantly. And that's how your 50 or 25 minutes are going to look. Yeah, it's like facing a little bit more of a crisp and polished Darian Caldwell at this point at 170 so we've got thompson moving on to face jeff neal the next fight a very interesting matchup because you have demian maya against conor mcgregor conor mcgregor a guy who competed at 145 won the championship in cage warriors and the ufc damian maya who's competed for a belt at 185 pounds in the past so matt i know we talked about it before we, we went live but there's going to be a big size discrepancy in that fight to me, this would have been a more compelling matchup if it was 2016, 2017. In 2020, I don't see it being as much of a compelling do, matchup because... See, this is where I disagree with you. But the interesting thing with Damian Maya, the last time that he went through a period like this, it was a number of losses and then a number of wins, and then he just dropped his last one to Gilbert Burns, and it wasn't really a close fight. No. It really wasn't. Now he's taken on Conor McGregor, and a lot of people ragged on us. Go back and watch it at Lightweight where we pump McGregor's tires and we pick Gaethje anyway. But in this fight, Conor McGregor, and we've talked about it before, is such a technical striker. It's the power, it's the technique, and I would argue as well it's a stance that poses an issue for Damian Maia in this fight. I, uh, I disagree. I think his stance is actually the reason Maia would win this fight. So McGregor stands southpaw, but his right leg's really far ahead of his left leg. That right leg, Damian Maia doesn't shoot for double legs. He only does single leg takedowns. That leg is right in front of Damian Maia this whole time. And we can make fun of uh, Skip... Uh, and Shannon for just spreading lies about MMA and not knowing what they're talking about. Damian Maya might actually weigh 30 pounds more than Conor McGregor by the time they step into the cage, though. Because Damian Maya, a guy you talked about, had a title fight at 185 against Anderson Silva. Yes, that was about 10 years ago, but even when Maya fights, you know, the modern-day welterweights, he's so much bigger than them. Go to the Tyron Woodley fight. Tyron Woodley, as big as a 170 or can get, or at least you thought. And then when he fights Damian Maya, Maya's way bigger. I think off size alone, and yes, you bring up the Burns fight, he got knocked out pretty quick. Maya did. He also took down Gilbert Burns in about five seconds, and Burns being the world jiu-jitsu champion that he is, was able to get back up to his feet and then make it a striking 
battle, but Conor McGregor, I don't think, possesses that same level of jiu-jitsu. Damian Maya needs one takedown. That's all he needs. And if Conor, if Conor's able to drop Maya at any point during the fight, he can't get on top of him. He can't swarm him, because all Maya needs to do is sweep him one time. And it's not one of those cases where McGregor's a bad grappler by any means. It's just that we've seen a guy who's average at grappling against arguably the greatest grappler of all time the size is going to play a factor at a certain point because a bigger guy can just naturally take the shots the smaller guy wouldn't be able to and Damian Maya is just an all-time grappling wizard so I understand why someone would say that Conor McGregor would beat Damian Maya it makes sense to me but personally I don't think Maya would lose this fight see and again I have McGregor winning this one and you know out of it we're gonna go with McGregor here but oh, yeah. the point being yeah you have to take into account that last fight and that's the issue for me and even going back I mean, yeah, he had the win against Ben Askren, but before that, he had a couple wins as well. He did. I, and did then it was a lengthy losing streak. It's a weird spot for him in his career because at one point after losing the last fight before going on the winning streak, if you can get that into your head, he talked about the fact that, yeah, retirement's looming. I don't know what's going to happen. And then he wins some fights. He's all excited to continue going on. Loses to Burns and then talks about, all right, I've got one fight left on my contract. I want to fight of all people. Diego Josh Sanchez. Fabius prospect, Diego Sanchez. I think Maya would kill him personally. Yeah, I mean, it would be a grapple fest, you would hope. But... <laughs> it, would, it would be the most one-sided grapple fest you've ever seen in your life. In terms of this fight, I think, again, with striking winning out and the fact that Burns already established the game plan, if you can land one hard shot and drop Damian Maya, and I know, I, one hard shot. I know. My di here's the difference, though, and it's my last thing to say. Gilbert Burns, after he dropped him, got on top of him and ground and pounded him. Because Gilbert Burns is good enough at jiu-jitsu to do that and put himself in those compromising positions. Conor McGregor, and again, nothing against his grappling, but he's not Gilbert Burns. He's not Gunnar Nelson. He's definitely not Damian Maya. And if you watch what Damian Maya was able to do to Gunnar Nelson, who happens to be one of Conor McGregor's jiu-jitsu coaches, if that guy can ragdoll your coach at the thing that he's supposed to be teaching you to beat this other guy in, I don't like your chances very much. So I know we're going to pick McGregor to go to the next round, but adamantly, I am saying Damian Maya would choke him unconscious. Yeah, you just got to wipe away the cobwebs and the nightmares of what happened to Gunnar Nelson. Forget about that. Exactly. And forge your own path on through to get the win. Now, the next fight, Michael, I'm excited about this one. Michael Chiesa, Colby Covington, I think it's, it's a closer fight than a lot of people would. Now, you look at Michael Chiesa and he's faced wrestlers before with mixed results. You look at the RDA win, great win. Okay. Not that he's a pure wrestler, but he's very good at wrestling for a smaller guy in a bigger weight and class. And the fact that Chiesa was able to take him down multiple times too. Exactly. But for me, the Michael Chiesa fight that I bet a lot of people would compare it to in this one is a fight that happened at 155 pounds that he lost, that he got submitted. It was Mary Yamasaki's last fight in the UFC. <laughs> it's the no, background. He uh, ref Priscilla Cashwear and Valentina shortly after. Yeah, that much is true. But it, it is, it is the uh, picture for a podcast early stoppage but still Michael Chiesa Kevin Lee a lot of people like in this fight against Colby Covington to that one but I think it's a lot more interesting than that because we've seen from Michael Chiesa since that fight holy smokes oh, yeah, turn it around crazy. and this is one of those guys that and I really like to talk about this he's one of those guys that corners a lot of fighters you definitely learn a lot more from that traveling around getting a lot of experience behind the cage watching so many fights that Michael Chiesa has been able to turn that around and at 170 he looks maybe not unstoppable but he's Huge been on a good run and he's a really big guy for the weight class it's crazy to look at him even compared to other welterweights oh, yeah. to see that holy smokes this guy's huge taking on colby covington it's a tough test i could certainly see a path to victory for him it's just you're taking on a guy that his only loss in the ufc was to warley alves which warley alves mixed track record but for colby Tracked covington it. for me it was that win over stun gun over in singapore that really put him over and that really started him on a path to get to the top now he, of course his last fight was a loss where did he break his jaw did he not break his jaw against Kamaru Usman who knows I'm not a doctor it was but, fight of the year quality though yeah it was a great fight and you could really see and hopefully a lot of people cut through the baloney to see that Colby Covington is actually a pretty darn good fight without a doubt and Michael Chiesa like you brought up at 170 not unstoppable but he doesn't really do anything badly he kind of frustrates his opponents and then he's just a little better at something else I don't think he gets enough credit for being as well-rounded as he is I think a lot of people think of Michael Chiesa as just more of a grappling heavy guy uh, he was he dropped Hori Masvidal in their fight a lot of people forget this he fought Hori Masvidal it would have been five or six years ago by now he dropped Masvidal and Masvidal choked him out with a Darce choke so it happened in Bizarro world but Michael Chiesa really good striker really good grappler really good wrestler really good defensively everywhere too not a guy who gets hit clean all that often I know Anthony Pettis is able to have a little bit of success but Anthony Pettis and especially at 155 one of the faster guys just regardless of division no matter what point of his career that he's at Anthony Pettis is always going to be a dangerous guy and 
the RDA win was interesting because RDA wasn't really able to take Casey down. And when he was, Casey was able to sweep him. I don't know if he'd be able to do that against a guy like Covington because Covington's just naturally a little bit bigger. And RDA was also coming up from 155. I know he's been at 170 for a little while now, but frame-wise, he's still more of a 55er who's just fairly bulky, so he's fighting at 170. Covington's not that, though. Covington could never make 155. He'd have to cut off a leg. Even though he's not the biggest 170er, he's still a good size for that weight class. I think the wrestling would play a big factor. He'd be able to wear out Case as the fight goes on, and then he'd pick up pretty one-sided unanimous. And then a lot of people are probably going to try and liken Kiesa, Covington, and Usman based on their RDA fights and who had the most success in those fights. Usman. Yeah, it was Usman, and it, I, Kiesa obviously finishing, and then if nope. you, or sorry, Kiesa went to a decision, but really earning a dominant decision yeah. win, sorry, and Covington, yeah, probably third in that pack. I yeah, guess. he probably is, yeah. which is it, and that's just why I'm in my math, like, you can't go to school and get a PhD in MMA math for a reason, it's, it doesn't help you at all. It's wild, though, how RDA has fought pretty much half these people in this list. But no, I think Covington would make it on. I'd love to see this fight get matched up in the future. I know Case has been talking about it a little bit. So hopefully we do get to see that sooner rather than later. Yeah, for me, though, the deciding factor, Michael Case does use distance quite well. And he's able to push and shove and then get in close, get the fight to the ground. That's kind of the game plan. With Covington, there's a lot of different ways for him to get a win. And out of that, you've got the volume, you've got the pressure, and a lot of five-round experience as well. So for those reasons, I would take Colby Covington in this fight. But I think it, it would be undersold due to the fact that maybe it'd be a foregone conclusion that Colby Covington could get the win. Very interesting matchup 100%. there. And so is the next fight. Jorge Masvidal, Gilbert Burns. This is a fight of two guys whose stock could not be higher. And yeah, I mean, Gilbert Burns probably could have higher stock. But he's out there pushing it on Twitter, Super trying to make any fight that he can. He wants Leon Edwards. He wants Tyron Woodley. He wants Usman. He Francis wants everybody. Ngannou. Francis Ngannou. And thank goodness that he doesn't want an interim or intergender championship belt around his waist like the Triple C. He's not on that cringe yeah, level like yet. Garcia and Ryzen. He's not there yet. But Gilbert Burns against Jorge Masvidal is a very interesting fight because these are two guys that are very well-rounded okay. and it makes for a great matchup. What do you think about that one? Uh, as much as I want to say Gilbert Burns probably wins this fight, he's not. Uh, this is, fight's a really bad style matchup for Burns because, again, this comes back to the whole looping shots versus straight shots. Say what you want about Jorge Masvidal. People like to call him a journeyman because his record's not great. If you actually watch him fight, though, records don't mean anything. Records are for that, DJs. They don't mean anything in MMA. But uh, Gilbert or Masvidal, the power that he possesses, and he doesn't even need that much space to do it. He dropped Nate Diaz with an elbow, a body kick, an overhand right. The versatility that uh, Masvidal has in his boxing and his kickboxing, I just think it would be too much for Burns. We can liken uh, Jorge Masvidal quite easily to somebody that hasn't been talked about a lot and actually has a fight book for this year. We haven't seen him fight in quite a while against Glover Teixeira. But you look at Jorge Masvidal, I'm going to liken him right now to Anthony Smith. And again, you could say journeyman, but as soon as they moved up a weight class, wow, look at the power yeah. advantage that they have. Look at the technique and their striking. And oh, by the way, and we saw it with Anthony Smith on his rise up, fights Volkan Uzdemir, submits him, beats him on the feet with the striking, submits him on the ground. That's something that Jorge Masvidal could easily do. And even before he went away and did his Spanish language uh, reality TV show, he was beating good competition. That, that's what I mean. Oh. People only want to remember Jorge Masvidal from Darren Till fight until right now, but he's so experienced. He fought uh, like, Gilbert Melendez for the Strike Force lightweight title in like 2011 or 12. That's how long it's been, and that's how long he's been in the forefront of MMA. So he he fought just to put this into perspective. He fought on Bellator one. Exactly, like he's been around for as long as that organization's existed. So if you have a guy with that much experience, really coming into his own as of late, maybe all the social isolation is really good for people because when Masvidal did finally come back from his one year away, and he was really open about talking about it, he was like. I got to just spend a lot of time by myself. I really thought about my fight career. I figured out, okay, if I'm going to make it to the top of this, how I'm going to do it, and i got to start going now. And he just been able to put it into reality so far. So as much as I like Gilbert Burns as a fighter, I just don't think he beat Maslow. I think Maslow's just at that other level that, Ma that Burns isn't at yet, but I do see Burns being there sooner rather than later. So Masvidal winning out there. Then we have, again, one of the best matchups. You've got the current uh, welterweight champ in Bellator taking on the former welterweight champ in the UFC. You've got Woodley versus Lima. It's such a great fight. Stylistically, I wish this fight happened again in 2016 yeah. or 17 uh, and not in 2020. But it's very interesting because for Tyron Woodley, I mean... It's tough to tell what you're going to get. He was booked nice. against Leon Edwards. Will we see that fight happen? And it was one where a lot of people were actually excited I, I to see Tyron Woodley competing. It was weird because people only want to see Tyron Woodley compete when they want to see him lose. But this felt like one of the few times where, and again, nothing against Leon Edwards. He's a phenomenal fighter. He's not great on the mic, though. So Tyron Woodley is going to be one of the few guys 
And it's not that Woodley's great on the mic either. It's just Woodley's better than Leon Edwards. So if you have to pick a side, you're probably going to pick the former champion. And it, I hate the rapping thing. But at least you've been able to see a little bit more of Woodley's personality, I feel like, ever since he hasn't been champ. When he was champ, a lot of the talk was he just complained a lot about the UFC. And again, I'm not... I don't deal with UFC like Tyron Woodley does. I don't deal with them at all. So maybe they were mistreating him, but that just seemed to sort of be the narrative about Tyron Woodley's career for the longest time. But ever since he hasn't been champion, he's gained a little bit of popularity because he's kind of come down to earth a little bit. And he's sort of, I don't want to say the people's champ, but a lot of people dislike Covington and a lot of people dislike Usman. So your next best thing is Woodley right now. And listen, Tyron Woodley's been in those situations before, a la Josh Koscheck, and everybody loved to hate Josh Koscheck. Chris Levin loved to hate Josh Koscheck, and that's what made the Ultimate Fighter Season 1 interesting. But if you go to Tyron Woodley and Douglas Lima, this is a really fun fight because you've got two guys that are incredibly powerful, very technical strikers, very good wrestlers as well. It's just there's an X factor in this fight for me, and it's the fact that Douglas Lima, if the fight goes to the ground, you really have to worry about his jiu-jitsu. He's going to strangle you unconscious. And here's the thing that I really worry about. If Woodley is going to do that whole, oh, I'm going to put my back to the cage because if I'm fighting a really good striker, I don't want them to have all this room to move around. I'd rather them come to me. That's the worst thing you can do against Douglas Lima because Woodley has some of the best leg kicks you've ever seen. He just doesn't use them a lot. He tore, I don't remember what it was with uh, Carlos Condit, but he won that fight due to TKO due to leg injury because of a leg kick and because of a lot of the leg work he was doing. So Tyron Woodley, if he went back to those leg kicks, started pushing the pressure like he used to do when he was champ, I'd say, oh yeah, Tyron Woodley has a really good chance of winning this fight. But that's what Douglas Lima does now. Exactly. Does well. So we're basically dealing with, oh, who would win? Tyron Woodley in his prime or... Tyron Woodley right now and I think Tyron Woodley in his prime would probably be Tyron Woodley right now not to say not to give anything away from Douglas Lima though Douglas Lima probably the fastest striker I'd say in the division probably the hardest hitting striker in the division again the only problem we've ever really seen in in his game is takedown defense and as of lately he's kind of short up those holes so I'm not really sure how you go about beating Douglas Lima right now yeah I mean if you want a good Douglas Lima highlight watch the last fight against Andre Korshkov in the trilogy bout now Great Night Picks is brought to you by Strikeforce Energy head on over to the website strikeforceenergy.com if you enjoy the flavor of freedom the company's veteran owned and everything's made in America they've got great apparel you can turn any 16.9 ounce beverage into an energy drink there's no sugar no calories no stirring or no shaking required they also have a line of different products as well as strike force coffee so if i head into my cart i've got a four count sample pack i've got a 20 ounce coffee mug and if i head into that checkout use the promo code fnp click to apply and you're going to save 20 percent off any order that's fnp at strikeforceenergy.com wow. so we have lima moving on let's move on through our bracket we've got lima mosvidal covington mcgregor jeff neal stephen thompson Kamaru uzman leon edwards these are all fights that, with the exception of uh, Masvidal Lima, you never know. Maybe they could happen. Who knows? That's true. And a lot of fun ones here. So if we start from bottom to top, Masvidal versus Douglas Lima, that's, again, that's another really fun fight. What do you think about that one? That's probably your fight of the night. Uh, if I was a billionaire, I'd probably throw both guys a lot of money, hope to get them out of their contracts. Just have the fight anyways, because why not? I like to have fun. Masvidal might be the cleaner striker. I do think this does come back, again, the whole looping shots for straight shots. Masvidal only going to throw those really straight shots. I know he throws overhead rights and hooks, but just when it comes to really technical boxing, Masvidal's probably the best out there. When it comes to technical Muay Thai, though, Douglas Lee was probably the best guy out there. And what's a ra what's a boxer's worst nightmare, too? Uh, we deal, uh, A lot of people like to talk about it when Nate Diaz fights. People talk about it when really any boxing heavy fighter fights. Worry about them kicks. Worry about them kicks. Jorge Masvidal is a really good boxer. And if he does get that leg chopped down, that's just going to drastically take away the power that Masvidal is going to have. And if you can drain his power bar and not be worried about the shots coming back at you, Douglas Lima just moving forward, not being afraid of getting knocked out, would be the scariest fighter in all of MMA. This is a weird thing that I'm going to say, but it's actually true. Douglas Lima would have a reach disadvantage over Jorge Masvidal. He used to fight at 55 or has fought at 55. Doug Slim, his next fight's booked at 185. He's going to be a bigger fighter, size disadvantage, but he's going to have a reach disadvantage. So for him to win, and it's typically the Doug Slim path to victory, move forward, leg kicks, exactly. Muay Thai. That's what he does very well. And for him in this fight, and I know a lot of people, and throw this one out in the comments if you'd like 
are probably going to go with Masvidal in this matchup. A lot of people are. And I would go with Douglas Lima, but I can definitely see a path for Masvidal. This is a close fight. Uh, both guys have the ability to knock each other out. And I know Masvidal's only ever been TKO'd one time in his career. Same thing with Lima. Two phenomenal chins. That's why this fight would just be good no matter what. You have two of the toughest guys in the division who are also the best strikers in the division's history. Let's see how that plays in for the winner going with Douglas Lima. But Probably you're going through a lot of punishment if you're Douglas Lima. Because remember, this is a one-night tournament, five five-minute rounds. You, If you're Douglas Lima, you face Tyron Woodley. That's a lot of damage. Phil Swift. Then you faced uh, Remix. Now you're getting Flex Seal the tape against Jorge Masvidal. That's a lot more damage. Now, more damage. in your fight on top of this, you got Conor McGregor versus Colby Covington, which to me... It's going to be a one-sided fight. Yeah. It's, it t unfortunately, if you're a McGregor fan, you're not going to like this one because with Colby Covington, it's the pressure, it's the volume, and it's the wrestling. And those are three kryptonites for Conor McGregor. Unless you're Jose Aldo, but still. Exactly. So you're fighting a bigger guy who does everything that your arch enemy does, but he's just bigger. So stylistically, this is a nightmare and for McGregor. And here's the only, uh, the last thing I'll throw in on this, because I do think this match is pretty, you know, cut and dry. Uh, Colby Covington could take you down from the middle of the cage. Khabib doesn't. Like, that's just how good Khabib is. He goes for takedowns in the middle of the cage just to get you up against the cage, and that's how he takes you down. Colby Covington doesn't even need to do that. Colby Covington just grab you in the middle of the cage, wrestle you to the ground. Not sumo style like Shannon Sharp would say, but he can do takedowns. He has a more versatile array of takedowns than even Khabib has. He's not as good on top, of course, as Khabib is, but he's able to take you down from a lot more areas. So against McGregor, that would kind of be his kryptonite. And a lot of people might try and point to the fact that Conor McGregor look at the success that he had against chad mendez but that was at 145 pounds and not at 170 chad mendez pounds. looks like he'd be colby covington's son like that's the size discrepancy between those two and colby covington's never been better like we've seen colby covington i know he lost his last fight but when you lose to a champion like usman in a fight that close it really tells you how good you are so it, it says more about covington than anything i think covington would run over conor mcgregor yeah so we've got lima moving on we've got covington moving on that's jeff neal stephen thompson that's a really fun fight now you also have to remember, Stephen Thompson's coming off a Magomed, Magomed, carry moth fight. If he was able to win, he was able probably to control distance, land his own shots, probably win a boring probably decision. A now you got Jeff Neal coming in off a Roberto Saldich fight in which you're probably, if you win that fight, you're probably going to take a lot of damage. Exactly. Like you're going to get rocked if you're fighting Roberto Saldich. 100%. In this fight, though, let's say that this wasn't a tournament style. I think that's a really interesting so fight. Fun. You could flip a coin to pick a winner. In this one, just based off their previous two or previous fight, um, maybe a little bit more cut and dry, but that's still a good fight. It is, and it's a fight that I hope we do see in the future at some point. Jeff Neal reminds me of a slightly slower Anthony Pettis, but he hits a lot harder. That's the good news for him. Problem, though, is Anthony Pettis needed his speed to hit Wonderboy in the first place, so if you can't hit him, you can't really knock him out. That's going to be Jeff Neal's problem in this fight. And again, the damage, like you said, that they acquired in round one is going to be a big, uh, going to be very important with this fight. So yeah, I think Wonderboy would win. Phenomenal fight, though, if it ever did get matched up in the future. And then your top fight, so you got Thompson moving on. You're top yes. fight you've got kamaru uzman versus leon edwards a fight that a lot of people more than likely they were just leon edwards but a lot of people wanted to see i mean it's a good matchup it's a fact that again and we've talked about it, leon edwards very crisp technical boxer kamaru uzman yes he has the wrestling some of the best wrestling in the game really but it's the fact that he's able to pressure and land so many shots in it's every fight also typically an exponential curve and he continues to gain and gain and gain as the fight goes on now in his first fight, Kamaru Usman's, it was against Ray Cooper III, if he's able to win that fight. Probably one of the easier matchups you could give him. Leon Edwards fought Nate Diaz. You're probably going to take a couple of shots. No, but you don't really fight Nate Diaz and make it out fine, but it can be done. So, uh, yeah. It's, I know it's, what you're it's still a good fight in the second round of the bracket. You still have two, hopefully, relatively fresh fighters, but... It's a very interesting one, nonetheless. Uh, Kamaru Usman, 30-26, Leon Edwards, the last time they fought. It was a pretty one-sided fight. It is a rematch. A lot of people like to forget about they fought earlier on in their careers. And it was a fight that you didn't really think either one of these guys would ever get matched up in the future. Luckily, they're both near the top of the division now. Kamaru Usman beats Leon Edwards five ways to Sunday, though. He has the thing that Leon Edwards doesn't. Leon Edwards, A, I've seen him get dropped by Brian Barberena. That's a bit of a red flag to me. And his... Was it a red flag for Vicente Luque? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was. That's why I said he's probably going to lose to Wonderboy, even though I really like him. 
And uh, I think I was going to go. Oh, and he has the wrestling. He just doesn't have the wrestling at Kamaru Usman's level. They are kind of similar on the feet. Two guys have good power and good volume. But when it comes to the grappling, Usman's just quite a bit better than Edwards. So even if they are getting about 50-50 in the striking exchanges, Usman should be able to, in theory, just take down Leon Edwards whenever he's in uh, trouble and just ride out the rounds that way. So I think Usman would win. Maybe not the most exciting fight in the world, but Usman would probably win quite dominant. And the thing that I want to say about this fight, both guys since they first fought have gotten a lot better. Oh, so yeah. I don't think it would be another 30-26. I think Leon Edwards right now, like, not that he's a champion, he's not on top of the world, but man, his star is quite high in the welterweight division in the UFC. But yeah, I would take Usman in that fight. So then we get to the round of two, the bracket of four. Kamaru Usman versus Stephen Thompson, Colby Covington versus Douglas Lima. We still have a non-UFC fighter at the bottom in Douglas Lima, but the top fight, Kamaru Usman, Stephen Thompson. So to recap, Thompson beat Magomed, Magomed, Karimov, and Jeff Neal. Now he's taking on Kamaru Usman. Usman beat Ray Cooper the third and Leon Edwards. I actually think that this fight is easier for Usman than his last fight against I'm Leon Edwards. I do. I Jesus, honestly do. I would like to hear The that. one thing I will say, and we talked about it for Stephen Thompson, so he's fought uh, wrestlers before. That's why he'd have such an easy job with Magomed Karimov. He'd be able to parry, counter, name of this show, and get out of the way and get the win. But I think against Kamaru Usman, it's just such a tough fight because you have a guy right now that's just about unstoppable. He's faced some of the best out there. He made Tyron Woodley look not like Tyron Woodley. Like he, He's but so good at nullifying certain skill sets. I think he'd be able to press uh, against Stephen Thompson and at least weather some of the storm to be able to get in close and get the win. So I think Usman wins. I think this is his hardest matchup in the whole entire thing. I'm saying the complete opposite of what Craig is. Wonderboy is just a terrible matchup for him. Again, if you can't get close enough to me, you can't take me down no matter what. And although Usman is a good striker and he's shown a lot of improvements in his striking, Colby Covington was able to land clean a lot against Kamaru Usman. And not to say anything bad about Covington's striking, he was able to land clean a lot against Robbie Lawler too. But... You have a guy who, I don't want to say Covington has pillow for fist, but he's not a knockout artist. He's not a guy who's going to go out there. Uh, even like a Max Holloway, for instance, who's a volume guy, he's still going to hurt you as he's putting that volume on you. Covington has the volume, but he doesn't really have the pop behind a lot of his shots. Wonderboy, and not to say Wonderboy is this thunderous knockout artist by any means, he's going to hit you if Colby Covington is able to hit you, and he's going to hit you a lot harder than Colby Covington is able to hit you. So I'm not sure where that threshold is for Kamaru Usman, where... Okay, I can take these shots from Covington, but I can't take these shots from Thompson. Everyone's chin's kind of in its own area. I think Usman has a really good chin. I think he's really good at wrestling. I think he's really good at striking. I think this is an awful matchup for him, though, but he would win nonetheless. How would he win if he's going to win? So, it's going to be interesting. I don't think he can win by decision against Wonderboy. I think he would have to finish him. Uh, and Wonderboy, if that's what you're hoping to do to beat Wonderboy, that you're probably not going to beat him. But I just think the physical strength of Usman would eventually wear on Wonderboy. So Wonderboy would win, you know, round one, two. He'd be getting off to a really good start in round three. But we've seen Wonderboy too. The tired, the more tired he gets, he'll start to make a few defensive lapses. He could get dropped at some point, get taken down that way, and then. Usman really only needs one takedown per round. It's just really hard to get that one takedown per round because of the way Wonderboy is going to be uh, standing. But I'm more willing to bet that Usman can get three takedowns in a 25-minute period than Stephen Thompson is to knock out Kamaru Usman. And I would think you get worn down by a great chain wrestler in Magomed Karimov. If you do, if he's able to get in close, then you face a great technical striker in Jeff Neal, and, and then you go the back edge. to taking on, yeah, a, another really, really good wrestler, one of the best in Usman. So I'm going to take Usman to make it to the finals. Now... Douglas Lima, Colby Covington, again, one of the more fun matchups because, hey, who wouldn't want Douglas Lima in the top 10 in the top 5 of the UFC's welterweight division? But we get it here in our semifinals. Colby Covington, he's taken on Conor McGregor and Damian Ma or sorry, Michael Chiesa. Chiesa fight, honestly, I think would be a little bit more difficult than the McGregor fight. Just style for style, size for size, too. Douglas Lima beat Tyron Woodley and Jorge Masvidal, and you are not going to come out unscathed in those fights. So if these guys fought just straight up, I would say Usman's going to knock out Colby Covington. But with the way that our bracket is set up, if Douglas Lima's even able to walk to the cage after fighting uh, Tyron Woodley and Jorge Masvidal for 50 minutes, basically, and then having to fight Colby Covington, and then another opponent later on in the evening, I don't like his chances. So if this fight was made fresh, just Covington versus Lima, I would say Lima knocks out Covington. But since it has to do with all the damage they've acquired, I'm going to say Covington wins by decision. And I would say Covington as well. So I've got Covington moving on to the finals. Oh boy, look at that. It's a rematch. Kamaru Usman like versus Colby Covington. But again... 
the factor of damage is really going to be the telling factor for me because you've got um, Chiesa, McGregor, and Lima. You've got Thompson, Edwards, and Ray Cooper the third. Kamaru Usman, to me, could possibly be the fresher fighter. Maybe that means something. Maybe it doesn't. But if you've got Colby Covington that just took on Douglas Lima, who, again, himself had a tough path, this is a really different fight than what we had previous. These guys at 100%, Usman beat Covington. So if Usman's going into the finals near 100%, because he's had three, not easy matchups, but three relatively easy matchups when we're talking about who Colby Covington had to fight, uh, I would say Usman beats him. That, that, Usman might not win by knockout every single time. And all those fights are going to be as exciting as the first one was. I think we are going to see a rematch of these two down the road no I matter so. what. So do I. It was, just, it was a lot of fun. I think Usman beats him about 7 out of 10 times, though. That would be my official prediction, if you will. Covington, the door's open for him to beat Kamar Usman, though. If a fight's that close going into the fifth and final round, the challenger has something to give to the champion. Like, how many title fights do we see where a challenger's really hyped up, and then they go out there and get smoked? It happens quite often. Like, MMA is one of the few sports where you can throw nine touchdowns in the last five well, seconds. Francis Ngannou, Stipe Miocic. I was going to say Yarzino, Rosenstrike, and Alistair Overeem, where everything can be going wrong for you. You can be down multiple 10-8 rounds at a certain point, but you only need one shot to end it. And again, with their fight, I don't really see that one shot being the factor, but I think Usman beats Covington the majority of the time, but I do think Covington will get a win over Usman at some point in his career. thought you were going with hype challengers losing in their big shot. That's what I thought you were oh saying. Gosh. But still, if you look at Usman and Covington, I had Covington winning right up until he got finished at the end of that fight. I mean, I had him up three rounds to two if that fit Ram was able to finish so it was a really close fight see i thought it was tied 2-2 going into that last round but usman was going to get a 10-8 in that last round so i i agree the fight was really close it's going it's going to be made in the future again really covington only needs one more win and then they're going to throw him back into the usman rematch because that's it just sells pretty well like you've got two guys who are going to go back and forth a lot so we are going to see that match in the future but my official prediction would be usman winning the rematch and i would go with usman as well based on strength of schedule in the bracket but just based on overall you know just the fight just we already, tomorrow, yeah the fight just happened and Usman was able to beat Covington though it was close and again you could flip a coin I bet you the odds in this one if it was a one night type of thing and you were live betting they probably would favor Usman quite a bit but still an interesting fight nonetheless let us know who we missed in this tournament again there's all sorts of great welterweights out there one of the deepest divisions in MMA currently and if you disagree with some of these picks maybe you thought Conor McGregor would beat Colby Covington maybe you thought uh hands of steel Jeff Neal would beat Stephen Thompson to move on to maybe face Usman who knows? Let us know in the comments. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Craig Allen FNP, at Matt Allen FNP, and at Fight Night Picks on both of those platforms. And let us know in the comments as well. I mean, this is an, a bit of an offshoot from Parry Encounter, but if you have some fight questions, some of these things that you want us to answer in actual Parry Encounter, we're still getting into those fan questions. So let us know below. We really appreciate all the support. Make sure you check out all the videos coming up. We got middleweight, light heavyweight, and heavyweight continuing in this week. So make sure you check them out. And as always, Matt, Fight Night Picks. Let's, Let's get, get into it. it.